Thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me for this conference on this uh, wonderful platform that you have here in, in Germany, uh, these research institutes cooperating together on several themes. And uh, congratulations that you started, successfully started this theme about energy transitions. Uh, first of all, I have to say, I try to avoid the word transitions as much as I can. I can't, can't do that for 100% because there's a lot of talk about that in literature as well. But I hope you, you will find out that my, I try to avoid the word transitions. Well, the, the first reason is it is a policy claim. It's hijacked by policy and it means something completely different compared to the introduction of the concept of transitions by a Dutchman, Jan Rotmans, tw about 20 years ago. Nevertheless, the theme is very well, and the starting point is I want to refer to the title of, the, uh, of this uh, conference, which is uh, Breaking the Rules. Why the hell breaking the rules? Well, that's very interesting because it relates to a fundamental concept that I'm using in this talk, but I'm using overall also in the concept of social acceptance of renewable energy innovations all over. Uh, social innovations is in the title and breaking the rules. And indeed, my talk is about institutional change. And institutions are by definition uh, I've, I've taken, uh, there are many definitions, but I've taken the shortest one there is, and it tells you exactly what it is. The rules of the game in society. Institutions are behavioral patterns determined by social norms and social rules. That's not only written rules, not only legislation. Sometimes it's very informal rules, but it shapes our behavior all over. And the energy sector is full of written and unwritten rules and norms. It is fully institutionally. And if we want to change it, and we have to change it, we have to change the rules, the rules of the games in, in society. Definitions by Douglas North, a Nobel Prize winner in economy. The renewables are natural resources. I will tell you in my talk, they can be seen as common pool resources. Uh, and I will use the theory of Common Pool Resources Management, which is also the founder of this theory, Eleanor Ostrom wrote, this is a completely institutional theory. The starting points of my talk are, first of all, uh, I want to walk a, a little bit. I hope you can, you can hear me at the back side, you can? Okay, fine. Uh, the power system, the power supply system is a socio-technical system. That is a concept of a system, not only hardware and technology, but just as much social, economic, political, etc. The society is part of that system. That's a fundamental starting point. So if you want to change it, you can't change just the technology. You have to change the way it is organized. Transforming this social technical system uh, into a, something renewable based on non-fossil fuels is not only changing the fuels, changing the technology, it's completely reorganizing the power supply system. Otherwise, it will not work. Uh, and that's innovation. And by definition, innovation is not a change of technology. It's mostly interpreted that way, mostly by policy, etc. Just change, change technologies, that's innovation, that's not innovation. Innovation is a change of ideas, and they become manifest in products and services, etc. So innovation is a change of ideas instead of products. Products are simply things in which we implement ideas. But it's also about reorganizing how we use all these things. So it's not only about the hardware, most important is the change of the software around this. And the key innovation uh, in, in power supply is that we have to move this socio-technical system away from a centralized design. Currently, our power supply system is very heavily centralized in hardware as well as in software. It's organized in a central way, and we have to change it into something which is sometimes called decentralized, 
but I will call it polycentric and distribu distributed. Uh, if you want to know what I mean, you have to write to uh, read this book. It's a fantastic book about the North American power supply system, the North American grid, written by Gretchen Bakker, and the, the good news is she's here at this conference. She wrote this book about two years ago. It's a fantastic book. It's not really a scientific book, but it's very well written, and it, 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 it tells you a story about the development of the North American grid and what is wrong currently with it. It's collapsing, more or less. We have the same problems here in Europe, not as, as bad as in the United States, because anything related to infrastructure in, in the United States is, is quite backward compared to Europe. Uh, uh, look at the president and you know what I mean. Uh, but the, the problems that she is writing about, we also have those problems here in Europe. What she tells us is the electricity grid is a machine, and it's not just a machine, it's the largest and the most complicated machine on Earth. It's completely designed by people, by human beings, and altogether it's a machine, very complex, etc., and it is in trouble. It is an infrastructure, it's all, all things are there, uh, transmission lines, power stations, etc., and it is into your home, all the plug-in stations you have in your home, all these things belong to that large, huge machine. But it's not only the hardware. The way designed, we have designed it, there's a lot of culture in it. So there is a social side in it. It's a cultural artifact, that's what she says. And it's a set of business strategies, also very social. And more or less, you can compare it to an ecological system. It's an ecology. Very, very complex, and all elements in it are related to each other. But the pro problem is, the way it is designed is for the century that has passed. She describes it very well, how it emerged in history, and it compares very much to how it, how it was designed here in, in Europe, too. And it's not designed for the 21st century. That's the problem. A number, large number of blackouts getting more severe, more frequent, etc. And we have that in Europe too. So we have to innovate that. We have to redesign it. Well, then we look at innovation theory, and I use the concept of institutional lock ins. The first time this has been described was by uh, a guy called uh, David in a very famous example about a lock-in of technology. And the example he gave was, we still use the QWERTY keyboard. It's on all computers, and it's on all machines where we write text. The QWERTY keyboard was designed for a, a, a mechanical machine by Remington uh, to avoid that all the hammers of the, of the characters will uh, will meet each other and, and will become entangled, etc. That's completely out of the question. We don't use that machine anymore, but we still use the keyboard. And there are much better keyboards, but we don't use them. Why is that? Because we invested so much time, energy, efforts to, in learning to type, etc. in that old keyboard. That's a typical example of a, a very simple technological lock-in. But this lock-in, much more complicated, we also have in energy systems. What well, well, this is written down is in, in a publication which, in my view, is, in my experience, the most important social scientific uh, publication ever written by Gregory Unruh, and he describes, he describes the institutional lock-in in our energy system, the carbon lock-in. It's completely carbon locked in. All the things that we have designed are designed for using fossil fuels. If you want to get rid of that, we have to find a lockout, and that is very, very hard. The existing configuration in the energy sector uh, has emerged in history for very rational reasons sometimes. Uh, it serves certain objectives. That's what you read in the book by Gretchen Becker too. Very, very rational. 
The only thing is that our ob objectives have changed. So all the decisions we made in designing this large machine are very rational decisions, but they don't work for the needs that we have currently. And one of the needs, most important needs, is that we have to change our fuels. So the social technical system is cross-linked, not only with itself, it's a very complicated large machine, but it's also cross-linked with all other sectors in society, with transportation, with agriculture, with industry, and currently, of course, with the information uh, sector very much. And that's also very much path dependency. And the current system does not serve our needs now, and that means that if we want to change it, we get, want to get out of the lock-in, we find much barriers because we have organized in, in a way and you can't get rid of that very easy. So we will meet a lot of resistance to change that. There are a lot of vested interests in the current system. And all the new elements of this social technical system are not easily accepted in society by all the partners, that uh, actors that make up that system. Particularly not the social elements of reorganizing that system. Those are the ones that are the most locked in because there you find most of the vested interests. So changing the institutions, that's what we have to do, but it, at the same time, it's the hardest thing to do. So moving away from the centralized and system, uh, which is also very much top-down organized. The current system is centralized. We have central power plants. In Dutch, you learn when you're two or three years old, you learn that electricity comes out of a centrale, a central power plant. That's what you learn. It looks like a natural thing, but it isn't. It's simply the way we have organized it because it was very rational about a century ago. And at the same time, distribution is also very centrally organized. And we regulate that in a very top-down way with uniform regulation and also, and that's part of the system, it's already a little bit more the software, but nevertheless it's very, very centralized. We have a centralized billing and accounting system. Uh, metering and tariffs is also very centrally designed. And it's not necessary to do it, but it was very rational to do it 50 or 60 years ago. You can find that in the literature why it is done that way. And we have, when we want to move away from the system, we all have all to change all that. All that centrality has to get out of the system. We will go to distributed generation, very much geographically dispersed. We will find a rapidly increasing variety in, in infrastructure, in ways of organizing it, in, in transmission, in generation, in storage, etc. And we will find that we need a system where it's not centrally governed, but governed from many different places and that what is what Eleanor Ostrom calls polycentricity. And we will find that we also are moving, we have to move to a system of distributed accounting. No central tariffs anymore. And that's a very, very hard to achieve because all government rules, all legislation, etc., is built upon centralized accounting systems. The definition of distributed generation is given by the developers of the concept, by uh, Ackermann Söder uh, in 2001, and I very much like their first definition of it. Distrib distributed generation, and it's now not only generation, but also all other kinds of, of uh, energy systems like storage systems, is an electric power source connected directly to the distribution network, so very low in the, in, the, in the hierarchy, or at the customer side of the meter. And that's all already a social factor, because the place where the meter is in your own home, it's the only thing in your own home that's not yours. 
it is owned by the grid manager or the energy company uh, at the customer side of the meter and that, 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 that place of the meter can and the ownership of the meter can be changed and it has to be changed. It's geographically dispersed. We will need numerous locations uh, with a huge variety. Just to show you the variety, there's a table of my last publication, only half of the table, and it's simply there to show you all the different types of uh, power generation based on renewables that we will find in our, uh, in our grid in, in, I hope, hopefully in 10 years or 50 years or 100 years. Uh, and it's all distributed generation. Uh, I will zoom in on something just to show you the variety. I showed you the entire table. For instance, PV panels, everybody knows them. They're about that large, so that means very small. They're smaller than a, than in size than a household. But you can do it in different ways. PV panel, panels, uh, 20 to 20 kilowatt. Uh, you can make a raise of, of, of 12 or 24 on your rooftop or whatever. But you can also build them in small power plants. And that's already different ways to do it. And that means that has consequences for the ownership and the management of that small power plant. And in the table, you can also see that it will have consequences for uh, the use of space and the way we take decisions over it in society. That's what you can find in the table in the publication. I will not talk about that, but it, it, this is simply to show you the variety. And then, that's the other part of the table in the same uh, in the same uh, paper. Again, a lot of variety, including storage facilities and also uh, transmission systems. We also introduce more variety in that kind of hardware and also in the ownership and management of it. Zooming in on that, on storage, for instance, battery storage, uh, fuel cells, electric vehicles, they have a battery in it, we can all use it in the new power system. And it's already all very small scale compared to the hardware that we have currently. And there are many, many more. Remember, a huge variety in hardware as well in ownership in, in governance, how we manage the system. And now our big problem, one of the, our big problems is not simply changing fuels, this is uh, an overview by, made by uh, another geographer, Václav Smil. He's working in the United States. And he shows why an energy transition is so hard. It's about the density of energy sources. Uh, the old ones, the fuel, the fuels you find at the top. And in the vertical, at the vertical scale, you see the power density in watts, units of energy, per square meter units of space. And there you can see that all our renewable energy sources, which are the gray ones, are much less dense in terms of the need of space to use them. And why is that? Because all the fossil fuels, of course, have energy concentrated in it over hundreds of thousands or millions of years. And we're using them just in a few century, centuries. And most of the uh, renewable sources we have to use immediately at the moment. The sun is shining, we can transform it into electricity and we have to use it at the same moment. So the energy density in terms of, air, of, of space that we need for it is very, very different. So if we change our system into something based on renewables, we need a huge amount of space. And this is something very typical. Hardly anybody in policy, and not even in the energy sector itself, realizes how much space we need in society for generating, storing, and trans transmission of electricity. And that's a big problem. The lots of space that we need. Numbers of locations, and the amount of space that we need in total. So now we go to social acceptance of all these innovations. This is the original concept uh, that I wrote with uh, Rolf Wüstenhagen, uh, uh, a scient uh, scientist working in, uh, in Switzerland, 
but he's actually uh, by birth a German. And we developed, uh, also on a conference, we, we developed the simple scheme of three different dimensions of social acceptance processes. <clears throat> social acceptance is not simply a position you're in favor of or against a wind farm or against a technology like nuclear power or whatever. It is a process. All the positions that actors are taking, it's not simply the public. Public acceptance is something completely different. You cannot, you cannot find it as a dimension in this figure. It's in fact in all three uh, dimensions there is a small part that is about public acceptance. It is about the acceptance of all relevant actors in society, about all elements that relate to the innovation in our power sector. And that's about uh, taking decisions about investments, about, uh, about the, 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 the space we need for the infrastructure, very important. And all the other elements uh, are there, but this is the, a concept that was developed about 12 years ago. Uh, there is a development in it. Uh, all these three dimensions are very much related to each other. And the most important part in terms of problems is the one at the, at the bottom, the social-political side. The decisions that have to be taken to support the things that happen in the, in the two other dimensions, in the acceptance of communities, that's acceptance about renewable energy projects most of the time, and the decisions made in the market, actors that take decisions to invest or not to invest, actors that uh, take the decision to buy renewable energy, consumers, uh, or not to do so, all these kind of decisions in economic terms are market acceptance, uh, and these things are supported or not by social political decisions. And that's the regulators, that's legislative authorities, or so most of the time governments, all other policy actors, all the, the ones that try to influence uh, the, the, the government decisions, all the key stakeholders in the current sector, and also, of course, uh, a little bit public opinion. There we take decisions about restructuring society, about different changing our institutional settings. And that's the part where the most resistance in society is. It's not in the community. That's uh, a misunderstanding about social acceptance, that the problems are people opposing wind farms. Of course, that's a problem too. But nevertheless, then you always have to think, why are people repose, uh, uh, opposing to a wind farm? And that m it's most of the time because of the choice sets that are in the project of, of, of that wind farm. And most of the choice, choices are uh, based on the institutional settings at the bottom of this figure. Well, one of the other problems, of course, is that all the, most of the renewable sources are varying in time, and they don't match with our demand pattern. That's one of the other problems, and that's one of the problems we have to save, and we have to implement a new type of uh, infrastructure for, uh, for solving that problem. So we have different variable uh, supply patterns, and we, have we, we need to optimize them to make, to make all these uh, investments in renewable energy uh, e economically feasible. Uh, uh, and when you find out is it is not simply decision making about installing solar panels or installing wind farms or using tidal energy, wave energy, etc. We have to integrate that. They all have different patterns and in these microgrids that I will come to, we have to integrate the different supply systems and we also have to integrate it with the demand pattern that you will find in the same microgrid. And there, where intelligent metering comes in, and we have to use intelligent meters, which, by the way, is something completely different what our governments in Europe and all over the world call smart meters. That's a stupid meter. It can't do anything. It only can read your, your consumption far from, from a large distance. And some energy companies have regulated that they can switch you off because you don't pay your bill, and that's what they call smart, 
But that's not what I mean with an intelligent meter. An intelligent meter is also processing data and also trying to manage your energy use in your home or in your factory or in your office building or whatever. And the intelligent metering should, should support the people that are not only consumers anymore, but also generate their own power, and that's what we call prosumers. And these prosumers can, for the reason of optimization, cooperate, and when they do that, they do that in so-called microgrids. Well, here you have, you have a community, a simplified community, some dwellings, an office building, etc. And these people are becoming prosumers. They have solar panels on their rooftop. The office building also have, has solar panels. You can see a small solar plant. You can see a, a wind farm. And our current system is centralized. So all these houses are connected to the public grid the office building, all the generation of power is also connected to the central grid. And we have advanced metering devices. That's what our government calls the smart meter. You, you, you hear I try to avoid, avoid the word smart as well, uh, because there is not so much smart about these, these devices. It's advanced metering device. That's what they use, they will try to use to implement demand side management. So they want to influent, influence our consumption patterns uh, and they do it for their own interest. And their own interest is not primarily renewable energy sources. Their own interests are primarily the large power plants that they own. So their interests are the supply patterns of nuclear stations, of coal, gas, and other central power plants. Well, the alternative is the, the intelligent grid, usually called the smart grid, but I try to avoid it. I want to have it really intelligent. This picture was made about 10 years ago for a, for a, for a uh, paper by uh, Emma Maris in Nature, and I'm still using this because, in my view, it's still the most uh, comprehensive scheme, simplified scheme of the uh, of the smart grid. And the definition she gives of the smart grid is still my definition. A future uh, vision on, uh, on the network is an integrated integration of microgrids, microgrids that can heal uh, and monitor itself. Well, what you see is uh, some sort of a spatial distribution of things. What you can already see is that the central power plant is no longer central. It's still called the central power plant but it's at the periphery of the system. People are generating power in offices, in factories, and at their rooftops, etc., and they try to use it immediately uh, at, at a small distance, because if you do it far away, you need a lot more infrastructure for, for transmission, a problem you're facing in Germany right now, because you generate a lot of wind power in the North Sea and in the North, and you have built your car factories in the south, in München and in and, and, and Baden-Württemberg, and there is where, where the electricity has to go. So you have a big problem with finding places, finding tracks for your large transmission lines, and uh, the people in between uh, don't accept that very easily. So it should be very close to the users, and that's where the intelligent grid comes in. What you see is the hardware. I'm using this picture already 10 years in, uh, for my students, and I always ask my students, try to think about all the social, social scientific research questions that you can find in this picture. You can find them easily, you use your imagination, because you, what is drawn is only the hardware, the, te the, the te technology. But there is a lot of organization in it. You just have to imagine and you have to and then you can see it. And I have a counter. I currently have 86 fundamentally different social scientific research questions about this picture alone. So the power grid is, cons uh, is consisting a network of integrated microgrids that can monitor and heal itself. And the fundamental question is, 
what institutional changes do we need to create this system? And that's uh, uh, something that is also about who will invest in all these hardware, in all these infrastructures. And most importantly, who will control them? Who is the owner, who's the manager of all these different systems? And what are they managing? Uh, it's an ownership and control is also about all the assets in the system. And it is about decision making, about the space that we need for all this infrastructure. So it's about the siting of wind farms. It's the, about the siting of solar uh, panels, of, of all other infrastructure, of, of transmission lines, etc. But it's also about who is collecting the data about what and whose data are it. Who's the owner of the data and who can use it? Well, here you see the same picture as I showed you before. And I move to the next one and you can see the hardware is just the same and the community is the same, but the design of the network is completely different. There is a public grid, still there is a public grid, and there is one connection of the public grid with the microgrid. People have organized themselves in this grid. And you can see the storage is now distributed storage. It's owned by the community of the microgrid. There is also prosumer storage capacity. That means storage capacity inside your home, your electric vehicle, for instance, but also small batteries, fuel cells, etc. The same applies to office buildings, etc. The solar power plant is also collectively owned and not owned by the energy company, but by the people in the microgrid, they also might own, have, might have connection to, uh, to a wind farm, a small or a large uh, wind farm. Uh, microgrids are not necessarily very small. I have seen studies about microgrids for cities like Yokohama, two million inhabitants, so that could be a microgrid as well. Anything goes, uh, but nevertheless, it is different from the centralized system, different from the public grid. And the only smart meter, smart meter, the advanced uh, monitoring device, is now between the public grid and the entire uh, microgrid. Because all the demand side management, which, which we do not call demand side management any anymore, because it's a centralized concept, is now demand response within the system. The storage capacities inside your home, but also collectives, are also co-produced. And co-production is a fundamental concept in the theory of common pool man management uh, systems. Well, the, the technology here is batteries, uh, different types of batteries, some of them still developing uh, technology. A lot of uh, fundamental research has to be done to make these th things really uh, fit to implement. But it also includes v uh, V2G, v vehicle to grid, that means electric uh, vehicles, uh, developing uh, sodium, uh, sodium sulfur uh, batteries, uh, thermal storage, developing super capacitors, uh, devices that you can use for rapidly charging your electric vehicles, for instance, but you can store energy in it at the size of a household. Uh, developing also fuel cells with, with, with hydrogen, uh, other possible options, flywheels. Personally, I don't believe in that option, but nevertheless, people are working it to make it, uh, to make it happen. Compressed air, superconducting magnetic energy storage. Uh, that would be a technology that can be used for very short-term balancing in, uh, in, uh, in microgrids. Also in development, it's not ready, to, ready uh, for the market yet. So, and, and, and a lot more. And another way to define social acceptance is to look at it as all these people all together make up a community in that microgrid. Uh, and they, I've seen it, thank you. Uh, and social acceptance is about all the elements that belong to the social technical system. And that compares to the social ecological system, which is the fundamental uh, the fundament of the theory of Eleanor Ostrom about common pool resources management. 
Her theory is based on the management of natural resources, but she also described cases of human-made uh, infrastructures like irrigation systems, etc. And she developed theories based on, uh, on economic and uh, political theories and based on, about, on, on a lot of empirical research all over the world, uh, theories about how to manage in a sustainable way socio-ecological systems. Uh, the essence is they are geographical, geographically very uh, various, very, very different systems. They're complex, and complexity and internal variety is a good thing. It makes them resilient. Compare that to the description of the, of the American and the European grid. They are vulnerable, very vulnerable, because they are uniform and large size. If something happens in the grid, it, has, it might affect the entire grid. Complexity and internal variety is good. And all efforts to simplify those systems are not a good thing. And there's a place on YouTube where you can see an interview with her where she uses these words. Simplifying the system is not a good thing. All these notions that come out of this run counter to the common sense views, uh, views that are held among policy and also uh, uh, about technocrats more broadly. This is Eleanor Ostrom. Unfortunately, she, she died about five or six years ago. She's the only woman so far who won the Nobel Prize for economy. The only woman. Uh, but she's very much like me. She's, she's not an economist. She's a political scientist, just like me. So the way she thinks is a lot, lot by, like me. And I have to admit, this is my hero. Contemporary policy, this is a, a literally quote. Contemporary policy analysis about the governance of common pool resources is based on three core assumptions. That's how we do it. And that's how we also manage our electricity system, our power supply system. Resource users are non-free maximizers of immediate gains. A lot of basic fundamental economic th theory behind it. Designing rules to change incentives of particip participants is a relatively sil simple, simple uh, analytical task. And particularly the last one, organization is it itself requires central direction. And based on all the research that she has done, quote, all three assumptions are a poor foundation for policy analysis. This runs counter to common sense views, but nevertheless, she showed with, with colleagues, a lot of colleagues, that this is true for managing natural resources. And renewable energy is a natural resource, nothing else than that. Trust is a key. And the, the, in, in her theory, the, she, she has several uh, fundamental elements about governing the system. That is self-governance, think about the microgrids that manage themselves, adaptive governance, easy to change things, and I will show uh, an example of that. Polycentric governance, not governed from one center, but from many different centers. And multi-level governance, actors of the socio-ecological system operate on different scale levels, etc. I will move quickly through uh, some sheets because uh, we're running uh, out of time. This is her fundamental idea about socio-ecological systems, and you can also apply this for socio-technical systems. There are four different subsystems, resource units, resource system, governance system, and users. And all these things are related to outside factors in the society, social, economic, and politi political settings, and also related to nature, to other ecosystems. And that's also what you find in the power supply system. These are all the variables that you will find in those four subsystems. And of course, I'm not going to discuss them all. We're already running out of time. I try to uh, refer to a, a few and I will skip a lot of them. Uh, in the resource system, you have to de define the, 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 the boundaries of the system. Well, the boundaries of the socio-technical system there are the boundaries of the microgrid. 
The economic value is, in red, peer-to-peer -peer deliverance. And that's related to my last example that I will show you, peer-to-peer -peer deliverance, which is completely different from the system that we have, because now you, the electricity comes from your energy company over the uh, centralized grid. And now we are delivering, possibly, to each other. My solar panels, my, maybe not are on my rooftop, but on the rooftop of, of my neighbor, because they have a house that's located to the south, so that's a better place to place my, but it's in legislation, it's not allowed that the, the power they generate is delivered to me directly. That's an institutional change we need. People should have the possibility to deliver to each other. Well, I, was, I will skip all the, the other ones you can see. Here's an, uh, an example from another uh, researcher, Esther Meilkamp, here in Germany, in Aachen, I believe. Uh, she has a, a picture of peer-to-peer -peer delivery, grid connection, photovoltaic system. This is a microgrid. It's connected to the central grid, but people, first of all, generate their own power, and they, live, they deliver the power to each other, peer-to-peer -peer delivery. And that's where all the really smart meters, so the intelligence in the grid also comes, because all the houses also have an energy management system for demand response and for regulating all these things. And this comes out of a paper where you can see a picture. This picture is not in the paper. I found that on the internet. But in the paper, the first microgrid based on blockchain technology is implemented in the middle of New York, in Brooklyn. And the mutual accounting is based on internally collected and internally owned data by the people that established that microgrid. And they use blockchain technology for the accounting. And why is that interesting? Because it helps to uh, create trust among all the people cooperating in this microgrid and trust is a key issue in the management of common pool resources management systems. Well, this is where it is located, in Brooklyn, in three uh, districts with, uh, with, uh, of the public grid. That's where you can find it. At the other side of the water, you have downtown Manhattan. Uh, this is the only uh, microgrid based, based on blockchain chain technology so far. In Amsterdam there is another project that also uses blockchain but it's not really a microgrid. It's still connected to the public grid. Uh, but this is emerging. And what you see here, the accounting also may become distributed. And that means that there is no energy company involved anymore. It's a complete move away from our central and top-down organized power supply system. And that's very interesting. Of course, it's very experimental. It's only there uh, since November last year. So what it really does, we don't know. So the example of the institutional conflict we're talking about, another example of a, a huge institutional conflict. If we have these microgrids, and we might move away from central energy companies, and we move away from the metering system that is uh, put in concrete in legislation, etc. the meters in your house that are owned by the grid manager, if we move away from that, you don't measure your energy flows anymore. And the data, the data are not collected by the energy company. Yes, the energy company, the data own, are owned by yourself. Then this means it becomes impossible to tax your energy flows. And that's very fundamental for the government system, as you can imagine. So intelligent meters, counting black blockchain credits instead of simple energy flows. There is no energy control, energy company control or grid manager can control. How can the, the energy flows be taxed? I'm very sure that all of our governments will find a way to tax our energy but they have to move away from the system that they have implemented right now. Nevertheless, I can tell you, it's a vested interest of governments 
and you will find a lot of resistance from governments to establish this kind of power system, which is one of the elements of the fundamental uh, carbon lock-in that we have, the way our governments handle and manage our energy system, because that's the last words I will say. I'm a political scientist, and the first thing I tell when I'm giving lectures about energy to my students is, there is nothing in the world which is so political as energy. We fight wars over it. On an international scale, the war in Iraq was basically about oil, about energy, but we also fight wars very small scale about a wind farm, a wind turbine in our communities. Uh, anything related to energy is very, very political. And there you will find a lot of the lock-ins in the system. For instance, the way that we still have uh, subsidies for fossil fuels, also in this country, in all other countries in the European Union as well. Uh, the, the, the amount of subsidy that goes to fossil fuels is about, is about five times as much as goes to renewable energy sources. And that's all government decisions. That's all social political non-acceptance. Thank you very much. You can see on the last slide all the, uh, all the uh, literature that I've used for this, this talk. You can find it when it's... I, I think the presentations will be on somewhere on the, on the website, isn't it? So you can find where, you, where all this knowledge comes from. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Please, uh, please stay here because we would like to um, follow up with a few questions and a discussion um, with the audience. Aha, uh -huh. I already see people raising their hands. Okay, just upwards. <laughs> oh, there's uh, a mic. This works? Very good. Thank you very much. Um, my name is uh, Wolf Peter Schill. I'm with DRW Berlin and also affiliated with the Leibniz um, Research Alliance. So thank you very much for the very inspiring and, and thought-provoking uh, talk. I like that. And at the same time, I would like to challenge uh, you a little bit. Um, so first thing I would like to say is that I think all the researchers dealing with electricity um, and electricity grids, no matter which field they're from, should reflect the physical realities of electricity systems and electricity grids. That's very important when it comes to things like peer-to-peer uh, -peer solutions, for example. And um, more concretely, um, when you seem to assume per se that decentral solutions are always beneficial or better, um, and the thing is, if you go for decentral renewable generation and, very important, decentral balancing, um, we know from tons of literature from energy and electricity system and market analysis that this is way more expensive than making use of larger scale geographical balancing and actually sharing all the resources you need to integrate renewables. So why are you so confident that people would actually be willing to pay the additional costs for these more expensive decentral solutions. Thanks. Um. Well, uh, you're, you're quite right. I'm, uh, it looks like I, I, I'm saying that decentralized distributed is always better. It's not. What I'm telling you is uh, now it's completely centralized. Uh, and we will move away from that, but how far we will move away from it, I don't know. Actually, nobody knows. There's a lot of research, also on the topics that you uh, mentioned, about uh, whether or not it's economically more feasible to do it this way or that way, and there are currently are many studies done about balancing in microgrids, and also studies uh, on, for instance, demand-side management show, and that's more social science, that people are less willing to cooperate in demand-side management systems where people uh, have to change their uh, energy consumption patterns based on uh, centralized uh, demand-side management. The acceptance of that is very low and the results are very small. So you can calculate what it costs to implement all these systems, but 
when there are no benefits, hardly any benefits of that system, you have a problem too. The acceptance of these kind of systems, well, probably, based on, on theory, the acceptance is much higher, but how high it is, we don't know, because we simply don't have that experience. It's all something that we have to find out experimentally and in the field in, in experiments like the blockchain uh, microgrid that, I, that I've shown you. Of course, we simply do not know. I'm talking about an energy grid that does not exist. So there are a lot of studies also in technology about peer-to-peer -peer management and balancing in, in, in microgrids and also model studies about implementing uh, balancing in the grid and some of them show that the costs of centralized systems are uh, much higher. But like in model studies, that's always the case. It depends on what kind of assumptions you're starting with. And most of the assumptions about the centralized grid are simply reproductions of the grid that we have right now. So the assumptions about a completely different grid, that's, that's guessing. We, do, we simply do not know. We have to find that out in practice. But there, in technology, there's a lot that helps this kind of uh, balancing in the grid. And the results will probably better. So the cost, cost might be sometimes, depending on where you are, it's depending on the ecology at the, at, at, at the site. For instance, there is a, a base, an article just published uh, uh, one month ago about a microgrid developed in Kenya. And there it's very economically feasible but simply because there is no public grid at that place. But it's using this theory to find out how this can be established and, uh, and how, it, uh, how it will work. And the, and, and the outcome is that it can be done. It's economically quite feasible, but of course in completely different circumstances compared to developed countries. Is that, is that a sufficient answer? Sorry. Um, I'm David Fortas um, from the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. Um, microgrids require a minimum density of prosumers to, to be viable. And that means that you have to have an, a certain number of people in a relatively small area in order to prevent the need to transfer energy over great distances, otherwise there's no advantage. But because you have so many people that are relatively located in the same geographical area, the conditions okay, do not vary amongst the prosumers and therefore everybody is facing generally the same situation. They can produce energy in the same way and they consume energy in rel relatively the same ways. So again, within the microgrid, you don't have the variation, the variation that you would want to see, which means that the microgrid is then is dependent upon the external grid. So you still need the external grid in order to solve certain problems. That also creates a situation that only places like, like Brooklyn, where there's a large density of prosumers, that's, it's not by chance that's one of the first places that's developed a microgrid, but then all the people who are geographically dispersed, they cannot develop microgrids. And so then you have people who are on microgrids and the people who will not be on microgrids. And that will develop different political preferences and so on. It's just what's happening in the United States. Democrats are all situated inside large cities and Republicans are spread out across the United States, the, okay? And so it creates this strong contrast, and so it's not clear to me that, that, that this is a preferable situation right now. Well, <clears throat> that's one of the big issues that we're talking about. So we have to deal with that. We have to avoid, and, 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 and I don't say that everything should be regulated at the local level, at the microgrid. The theory of Ostrom tells us that we still need national governments and also international uh, uh, agencies. Uh, it is a multi-level theory. So the, the only thing is that you have to think about what kind of decisions are made at, for instance, the national level. And now we make a lot of decisions at the national level about the power grid 
uh, that could be shifted, moved away from that level to a better level. But that does not mean that we do not need national legislation anymore. For instance, national legislation that is uh, telling us that we cannot simply establish microgrids and simply not give access to people who do not have so much resources. That's something that you can regulate at that level. That's a very simple answer, of course, and I don't know how to do that, but that's, that's one of the things that we have to find out. We are researchers. We have to find out these things, how this can be done. The only thing I'm telling is the way we have organized it right now creates a lot of barriers to establish. And the other interesting thing that you mentioned is, well, microgrids could be built among consumers that are very similar to each other. No, the theory tells us it's a good thing to implement as much variety in the system as you can. That's why I showed you this, not simply only houses that are part of the microgrid, but also an office building, but it also might also be a factory, public buildings like sports facilities or, or whatever. So the more different uh, users you have in the microgrid, the more variety, the better it is. That is what the common pool resources management theory tells us, that differences and variety creates more resilience in the system. And then the other thing, what you said, I still have a connection to the public grid. Uh, of course, island community uh, grids will also exist. For example, on islands. Uh, that's that's t a typical place where you will find the first microgrids that are established. Right now there is a project in Denmark to establish uh, a microgrid uh, on the island of Bornholm. Uh, and that's typically an island far away from the rest of, uh, of Denmark. So that's the, the first places where it becomes economically feasible. And the, the people involved in the, in the uh, Brooklyn microgrid well, the variety is not very big there, and it, but it's not too dense. In fact, it's, uh, it's all located here in three different grids, that, but that doesn't mean that all the people in, living in those, in those areas are part of that uh, grid. It's more or less a virtual, a virtual microgrid. And the variety is not very big because the people involved in this are, are, are absolutely nerds. <laughs> But that's interesting. Uh, a co-author of the paper by Esther Mengelkamp is one of the establishers of the microgrid in, in, in Brooklyn. So that's very interesting. And it's a field experiment, but of course, there is not too much variety. And interesting is that you also say, well, this can be done in highly densely populated. The first reaction when I made my first research proposal on this a few years ago, the reaction was, is, this is not something you can do ever in an urban environment. Of course, this is about renewables and, and wind power, etc. So this is only interesting for rural areas. Completely different. So, And I will say, no, it's interesting for anybody all over the world. Um, Self-governance and self-organization is a key, key factor in your thinking about microgrids, about peer-to-peer -peer deliverance and so on. But as social scientists, we have to consider the social constraints for that. Because so far we see prosumers are a very small group. So far this is a middle class phenomenon. And why are you so confident that people are ready and motivated for self-organization, for self-governance? Well, I'm not so confident. In fact, I think uh, this will not happen easily because the institutional settings in our society don't fit to this. That's our big, biggest problem, that we have to change regulations, etc., and that should be done at the national level. And most of the barriers for this are institutional barriers. They're not physical barriers. Of course, there's a lot of technology and there's a lot of natural uh, science in it. That's, that's also related to the first question. 
Uh, I haven't shown that here. I've shown the picture of the energy density by Václav Smil. I also could have shown the book by, uh, by uh, David Mackay, uh, Without Hot Air, and he is showing the same thing, the huge amount of space that we need. One of the things that is very important and what comes out of all social science research on renewable energy is that you cannot implement renewable energy without the participation of the communities. And that's very important. And that's typically something that, has, that is done when you do it in, in terms of, of, uh, of microgrids where people own and manage, uh, but there are many different uh, ways to do it, but uh, have a real participation in how it is established. It makes me confident that out of our research comes that all the things we do in renewable energy that are top-down uh, steered have a tendency to fail. And all the things that we do where we implement participation processes and where we give initiatives to people to do it themselves in their own way, at least have a certain uh, power in decisions over it, about uh, the space uh, decisions, for example, have a tendency to be much more successful. The, the, f the, the most simple ex uh, 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 example I always give to my students is in, 19, in this country, in 1998, at the moment that there was a real institutional change, that the, the system of feed-in tariffs for wind power was implemented, in 1989 in North Rhine-Westphalia, and in 1991 in all member states of, the, of Germany. Before that time, in entire Germany, there was less wind capacity uh, installed than in, in the Netherlands. Within two years, there was three times as much wind capacity installed in Schleswig-Holstein compared to the Netherlands, only in Schleswig-Holstein. And why was that? Because the feed-in tariff system opened the opportunity for citizens to invest and to take initiatives to establish wind power development. It was mostly uh, collective citizens that did that, cooperations of the citizens that established wind power in the 90s, in the early 90s. There you show there was an enormous acceptance in society but it was uh, resisted by the legislation that was in place before the 1990s. And all of a sudden it opened it up. And at the same time you could see that the resistance came from the current existing uh, power supply system. The, uh, the energy companies went to the Bundesverfassungsgericht to, to get this uh, feed-in law, Stromeinspeisungsgesetz, get it away. And they went to the European court and they lost. Very good thing, they lost. But they tried to, to block it. And that's what you see in all countries, that energy companies try to block the opening up of the lock-in system. When you open it up, you will find that society is taking initiatives and there is a lot of acceptance. Not always, no guarantees, of course. The entire process is far too complex to give uh, such simple answers to questions like this. Thanks again, uh, Martin Wolzink. Um...